a robot voice will probably come on or say, uh, would you like to continue that we are recording you? Uh, so the reason I wanted to record this is this session will be placed on the Graduate School YouTube channel. And we have Drew here today who will be leading the session on interpersonal communication. I've invited him in because I'm not an expert on it. So I'm very excited to, to hear about uh, tips and tricks on, on being more effective with interpersonal communication. And uh, we have invited him in for something called the Graduate and Postdoctoral uh, Success Group. And we are bringing you as many different types of trainings as possible to get you ready for your work here at the University of Texas San Antonio or as you make the transition to your next career. So I think interpersonal communication is going to be awesome for you no matter what you are doing or where you are going. So I'm going to turn it over to Drew. Perfect. Well, hi, everybody. Um, as Dr. Boss mentioned, my name is Drew Shelnut. I'm an assistant director of the Leadership and Volunteer Services Office uh, here at UTSA. So uh, leadership development programming, as well as opportunities to get involved in volunteering, both on campus and the community. So if you're looking for any of those things, our office is kind of your one-stop shop um, to get those opportunities. So if you have any questions, I will put my email in the in the chat at the end. So please feel free if you do want to know any any more about any of our programs to reach out. So today's workshop is looking specifically at interpersonal communication. And so the Student Leadership Academy um, as a whole is a set of 10 workshops. And this is one of our um, split across, across three levels. And this is one of our individual focused workshops. So the three levels are individual focused, group focused, and society focused, looking at the, the same levels that we use for the social change model. So this is one of our individually focused workshops. And the Student Leadership Academy as a whole um, is designed on the NACE competencies, which is the National Association of College and Employers. And every few years, they do a survey nationwide of employers asking, what skills do you want students to have when they graduate? What are the things that you want them to be able to do? And so from that set of skills is how we came up with the topics for the Student Leadership Academy. But in addition to NACE being kind of one of our, our guiding, um, guiding sets of principles, we also use the social change model um, by Aston and Aston as one of our other key indicators. And so we, we not only want people to, to go through these workshops to be able to succeed in the workforce, we also want them to be empowered and compelled um, to be catalysts for social change in their communities. So hopefully at the end of these workshops, you'll be able to do both of those things. So let's talk about the new skill sets that you have. Um, uh -oh. It's probably on my end. Let me see. I may move a little bit and we'll see if I can, if it gets a little better. Let's see, does the audio sound any better now? So much better. Perfect, awesome. Yeah, perfect. So um, quick recap, goal of Student Leadership Academy is both to develop uh, those uh, job related skills as well as to develop your capacity for being a catalyst for social change in your community. So as I mentioned, 10 workshops split across three levels. Um, and then six action steps total. But each of the action steps is really meant to be about like a two to five minute, a really quick thing of how to put these uh, ideas into practice. And if you complete all of the 10 workshops and six action steps, there is a medal that you get as part of your graduation regalia. And I can show that to you at the end too. Um, so it's a pretty cool perk at the end of the program if you are interested in completing the whole thing. So as I mentioned, today's session is interpersonal communication. And so the three main objectives for today are to explore the elements that comprise effective communication, to list the components of and to practice active listening, and then also to discuss some tactics on how we navigate challenging communication situations. So we'll start off with the communication formula. Um, and this goes back to a study by Dr. Albert Morabian, um, where he looked at the pieces of communication and he did a study to try and figure out what is the um, relative importance of each of these three pieces. 
So the pieces he looked at were spoken word, voice and tone, and body language. So I want to ask y'all what y'all think. Um, how important out of 100% total, um, how important are each of these pieces relatively? So percent uh, value of spoken word, the percent value of voice and tone, and the percent value of body language to add up to 100%. And feel free to unmute yourself or to share in chat. Either way is totally fine. Okay, so I see 30% spoken word, 10% voice and tone, 60% body language. Definitely. I see a 33% for each, 20% uh, spoken word, 10% voice and tone, 70% body language, 50% spoken word, 20% voice and tone, 30% body language. 60% spoken word, 30% uh, voice and tone, 10% body language, 30, 40, 30, 40, 30, 30. So a lot of different impressions about what the relative importance is. So as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Morabian did his study and found that the elements of personal communication, 7% of what we communicate is really delivered by the spoken words, by the words that we're saying. 38% of what people take away from what we communicate is in voice and tone, and 55% is in body language. So obviously, as graduate students, you want to go in, you want to look at the data, because there are some, some uh, confounding pieces to uh, Dr. Morabian's study. It's also a, uh, at this point, almost 50-year-old study. So it is, it is older, uh, but it still gives some important things to think about uh, when we think about the context of how we communicate. Um, looking forward. And the big pieces that I always like to, to emphasize here are when we think about how we communicate typically, um, particularly in the workplace, how are we communicating with, especially right now, with our, our coworkers, with our supervisors? What is the majority of what we use? I'm sorry, you said what, which one do we use amongst coworkers? Right, coworkers, supervisors, like within a work context. So uh, a lot of times, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, say, I mean, spoken words, but I would say voice, voice and tone, depending on whether we're talking to coworkers or a supervisor, I would assume you, you would fluctuate that tone depending on like role. Definitely. And I see in the chat, um, I see spoken words, um, email. And then I feel like there's more concern about uh, what we say versus how we say it. Um, and so we think a lot of times in, in the context of the spoken words, of the words that we're actually using. And so much interaction, definitely, Dr. Boss, so much of the interaction during work from home is text messages, is emails. And so we're losing all 90, all 93% of what we're trying to communicate of that voice and tone, the body language, and that 7% is all that we're giving. Um, in a text message, in an email, we're losing so much of that. And the key thing to think about is we've been doing that for a while. We're used to emails, we're used to text messages now, but what that means is that we've also adapted to the fact that we're missing that 93%. And the way that we've adapted is by filling in the blanks. And so we get used to this idea of when we get an email, when we get a text message, we read voice and tone into it. We figure out, okay, what is this person actually trying to say? Is this person really upset based on the language that they're using? And um, what are they trying to communicate? Is there something more here that they're not saying? And we've, as a society, in a lot of ways, adapted to that idea of there is more. There's more here that I'm not getting. And I'm going to try and figure out what that more is by using context clues. So the key thing is realizing that when you're giving those communications, particularly in email and text message, that people are reading into them. People are reading for context clues. So you want to make sure as much as you can that you make those communications um, clear and to the point, uh, but also that you're giving uh, that information as best as you can. And with that, there's an interesting piece of information too that I found, um, a different study that looked at communication styles and age. And there is a huge difference between the ages of about 35 to 40 is where there's this, this sudden change, basically. 
Um, and that change has kind of progressed over the past 10 years. So it's, it's really just a certain point in time um, where things changed. And people over the age of 35 to 40 tend to the average business communication, business email is about two sentences. Whereas people under the age of 35 to 40, the average business email is six to seven sentences. And so there's this big difference in terms of how people over 35 to 40 communicate in business communications versus people under 35 to 40. And I think part of it is that same idea of, you know, we've adapted. And so for people who grew up using email, who grew up using text messages um, as their primary forms of communication, they know that people are reading it. And so they give a lot more context to what they're trying to send of, hey, I'm asking you for this. And here's why I'm asking you for this. And I want you to know exactly what I'm asking you to do and why I'm asking you to do it. Whereas typically people over 35 to 40 grew up having those communications in person. And so never really necessarily had to think about what are people reading into the things that I'm saying in an email. And so for them, it's just typically a much shorter email of, hey, here's what I want you to do. That's it. Um, so something to keep in mind as you communicate with different people, look at the emails that they send you and chances are that's what they're looking for in return. So if they're sending you those shorter emails, then chances are they're probably not going to be reading as much into your emails. Um, they're just looking for a yes or no answer. They're looking for short context. Whereas people who are sending you a little bit more probably want a little bit more in return. So that in mind, uh, we're going to go into an activity and I will need one volunteer. And sorry, I should say, before I ask for the volunteer, on your screen is what you will be volunteering for. So I don't want, you put it, want to put you in a situation um, where you are unsure. So the volunteer will be emailed an image, which they will describe to the group. All the other participants will draw what is being described to them. And then at the end, we're gonna share what we created um, based on the description of the drawing. So if you're volunteering, what you're volunteering to do is to describe an image that is sent to you. Awesome. You're right at the bottom and so it's cutting off your name. I'm sorry, what is your name? Jess Reed. Awesome, thank you, Jess. There we go, now mm -hmm. I can see you. I hope people know Bob Ross. This is Bob Ross and Bob Ross is, was on PBS doing artworks and his whole idea was you should do art because you love it, because you enjoy it. And uh, the, there, are, there are no mistakes, only happy accidents is kind of his catchphrase. Perfect. So Jess, if you can send me your email um, as a private message, I will go ahead and send you the image to describe. I uh, just sent that over to you. And so, um, yes, if you, uh, if you have like a virtual program that you wanna use like MS Paint, totally fine. Or if you wanna just get out a piece of paper and, and a pen or pencil, that's also totally fine. Whatever is easiest for you. Okay, I have it open. Perfect, perfect. And so, Really, no restrictions. You can use any words you want to describe this. Um, you can give any sort of context. The only thing that you can't do is show the picture. Okay. So however you want to describe it is totally fine. Okay. Um, it's, um, it's an oval that's kind of wide. Um, the oval kind of extends vertically and up and down a little bit. So it's a little bit fatter on the sides. And then at about one o'clock on the oval, there's a donut shape there, but it's also in the shape of an oval. At about three o'clock on the oval, there's three circles um, kind of overlapping each other, not quite like a Venn diagram, but like if the circles were extended and overlaid on each other, there's three of them there. 
And then at about five o'clock, oh my goodness, I wish I remember my math shape names. Um, there is a, what is the name of that shape? My goodness. It's the shape at, at five o'clock on the oval. It's the shape that it's like a square that opens up. It looks like a pot for my planter people out there. It looks like a pot. And then next to that at about seven o'clock, there is a 90 degree triangle with the widest part of the triangle facing inwards towards the inside the oval. At nine o'clock, it's a regular square. Lewis Beth. Joined the meeting. Um, at 11 o'clock, there's two arrows. They're connected. They're three-dimensional. Well, I would say two-dimensional, but they're connected. So it's not just a line, you know, they're outlined. One arrow is pointing up outside the oval. And then the other arrow is pointing to the left outside the oval. And all of these objects are inside the oval. And then the last piece of this is there is a line from about 10 o'clock criss cutting across the oval to about four o'clock. And the line begins just outside the oval, extends all the way through the inside of the oval, and then extends beyond the oval a little bit further on the bottom than it does at the top. And then at the end of that line, very bottom side, four o'clock side, uh, there is a little arrow. So it's like, like a graph arrow that you would see. Very subtle, you wouldn't really notice it unless you paid close attention to it. And that's about everything. Awesome. So now I'm gonna open it up for questions. Does anyone have any questions about the descriptions that you just got? What was, uh, I couldn't catch up on the one that was after the circle at one o'clock. Um, at, at three o'clock, there's three circles. Um, they're not donuts, they're just regular circles. And they kind of like crescendo down. They overlap each other a little bit, kind of like linking arms, if, if you want to envision it that way. And you said everything was within inside the oval? Yeah, everything is inside the oval, yes. Okay. Any other questions? The right triangle at seven o'clock, is it the like squared off piece is towards the outside of the circle? You said the bigger piece was towards the inside. I didn't know uh, part of the triangle. The 90 degree angle side that's facing the outline. So it's, it's opening up into the circle. Perfect. There goes the body language. <laughs> When we reveal these, let's not judge my drawing. <laughs> no judgment, no judgment zone. Awesome. Any other questions? Remember, happy little accidents. Definitely. Awesome. So if you are able to turn on your uh, camera and show your drawing or uh, share screen and show your drawing, please feel free. Actually, I'll stop sharing so that if anyone wants to share screen, they can do that. Oh, actually, I don't know if they can. Let me see. I think I can give them that power. Let's see. Multi -par multiple participants can share simultaneously. Oh, this is so cool. Oh, there's a screenshot in the chat. Ah. Mm. That is so cool. <laughs> now I see, because I know you said it was like outside of the circle, but then they're all inside the circle. I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Should I share my screen since, or since I have the image up? Yeah, uh, that'd be great too. If you, if you can, I think you should be able to share your screen at the same time. Okay, I have the image. Um, share. Can everybody see it? 
I only no, it looks like you're still on the previous one. Oh, I think I know what I did. Let me try it again. Let me see. If not, I have it on my next slide. So. Okay, well, that's fine too, yeah. Awesome. So before I go to the next slide, just want to say a huge thank you to Jess. Great job. Um, as you can tell from trying to recreate it, this was not a simple image to recreate. So a lot going on here. So here is the image um, as it appeared to Jess to be described. So some key questions. Um, how does your image compare to the original image? Do you feel like you got pretty close to what it was, what it was supposed to be? I think I got, I, I messed up that donut and those arrows. <laughs> <laughs> About 70%. I feel like on like a Mario game, we would have actually scored like a solid 75, 80%. Like that would have been enough to pass. Definitely. So looking back at your drawing, where were some of the areas where you felt like um, it was a, the biggest issue or the biggest barrier to recreating what you saw? Where do you feel like you were the furthest away? Okay, so proximity to each other, proximity to the oval. The <laughs> biggest barrier is the use of Microsoft Paint. I feel that. I think the circles okay. of three o'clock are mine. Um, I overlaid, overlap mine more like a Venn diagram than kind of the way that Definitely. it's revealed. And I was gonna, you know, I was trying, that's the first thing that I thought about, but I'm like, I, I try to envision what a typical Venn diagram looked like. So that was actually a tough one for me to, to get out there. Definitely. And it was actually, so I've, I've facilitated this workshop several times. And the last time that I facilitated it was the first time out of probably near 30 sessions that anyone described it as a Venn diagram. And people were like, oh yeah, great. The normal way that people typically describe that is, have you ever seen the hungry, hungry caterpillar? And you're trying to create the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar, which is great if you've read the Hungry Hungry Caterpillar, but there's always at least one person in the group who's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So trying to think about definitely Audi or Olympics, also really good. Those overlapping overarching circles. But one of the key things to think about is, you know, we're using um, kind of what just mentioned with the, uh, the shape in the bottom right. Um, it's been so long since I've taken geometry. Like, what is that shape even called? I don't know. And the good news is it's not just you. Like, chances are the majority of the audience, the first time somebody called it a rhombus and everyone in the room was like, what just happened? What is the word that was just used? So, you know, trapezoid, rhombus, and um, there are all these different words that, that people were using to try and describe it. But then everyone was like trying to go back in their head to like seventh grade math. And like, I cannot remember that far back. Even if you tell me what it is, I can't, I can't recreate it. But planter, yeah, planter was a good frame of reference. So for the gardeners out there, like immediately, like, yes, I know, I know what that is. I know how to create it. So thinking about those, those ways of what are the common terms of ter and terminology that we can use that's going to be known across the board. And sometimes we think of these things as common terminology. Like when people say the hungry, hungry caterpillar, they have every expectation that everyone in the room knows exactly what the hungry, hungry caterpillar is. But it's all about making sure that everyone has that same common frame, frame of reference. And then also the idea of like looking at the image now, is it important to know that like the, the right triangle is considerably further into the oval than like the two arrows in the top? Is that important? And the key thing is it may be or it may not be, uh, depending on what you're trying to recreate. So if you're just trying to get all of the things together and in the right order, um, we did that, we accomplished that. So the key is also when you're trying to communicate, make sure what the parameters of success for communication are. Make sure that you know exactly what it is that you're trying to communicate. It, are you just trying to get the shapes in the oval? Are you trying to get people to cre recreate it exactly as it appears? Um, and particularly when you're, you know, when you're a supervisor or when you're working with a team and you're trying to communicate to others how to do something, make sure that you're clear about what is success. What does that look like? So with that in mind, um, after going through the active listening, uh, after going through the activity, we're gonna talk about active listening. 
So I want to start off with the question of who in your life is a great listener and what makes them a great listener? What do they do that implies or shows you that they're a great listener? Mine would be my dad. Awesome. And, and what does your dad do? He, makes... he maintains eye contact. He kind of nods um, just kind of in agreement, I guess. And then he asks questions. Um, about what I'm saying, so. Definitely. So eye contact, um, asking questions, getting more information. Um, sister rephrases, so takes what you said and tries to give it back to you to show that they've understood. Um, no judgment, so I know that this is someone that will listen to me, not try and um, pass judgment or tell me what I should be doing, but just listen. Um, not interrupting, definitely a big piece. So I think, uh, what's sorry, go ahead. I have a, I have an eight year old and I think she's a really good listener because every time, let's say she asks something or I'm talking, she asks you to rephrase to make sure she's understanding. So if I go, uh-huh, she's like, I need to know yes or no. Or if I say maybe, what does that mean? And so I think um, I really like her listening skills. <laughs> Definitely. Clarifying questions are hugely important. And then someone making you feel like they're focused on what you're trying to share. So avoiding distraction, really being there in the moment, not just with eye contact, but also just physically and, and emotionally being present. Definitely. So I include this quote because I think it's really important um, from the context of who it's coming from. So Diogenes, who is known as one of the greatest speakers um, in ancient Greece, he was the, known as the cynic, um, famous for his oratory, said, we have two ears and only one tongue in order that we may hear more and speak less. And that's from one of the greatest orators of his time, one of the greatest public speakers saying, in order to speak effectively, we have to listen. If we want to connect with people, if we want people to understand what we're saying to them, then we have to listen. We have to understand them first. And so... It's important to think about that when we're thinking about how we communicate with others. The first step is always active listening of understanding who you're talking to and understanding their needs from you. So we're gonna look specifically at the EPMD model of active listening. So it's four pieces, easy, easy acronym, EPMD. Um, eye contact is number one. So as we mentioned, making sure that when someone's talking to you, you're making that physical eye contact with them. They are, um, they are there physically present with you and showing you that by connecting with you that way. P is posture. And so this is really thinking about um, both in terms of physical posture as well as voice and tone posture that you're matching the person that's talking to you. So if somebody's coming to you and they say, hey, I have the best news, something really great just happened to me. And you say, yeah, tell me about it. It's probably not going to encourage them to really want to share that. With you. Um, it doesn't show that you're really connecting with them and what they're trying to say. On the same way, you know, if somebody comes to you and they're like, I just had the worst day and you respond with, yeah, what happened? Also doesn't show that you're connected. So make sure that you're matching their, their, both their body posture as well as their voice and tone, that you're showing that you're connecting in that way as well, that you're reading into what they're giving you and that you're responding back appropriately. The M is for mirroring, which is really thinking about um, kind of what we talked about, about that summarization and giving back what was, what was uh, being talked about. So that can either be asking questions for follow-up of getting that additional information to really understand, or it can be the, the summarization of, oh, so what you said is this. Shows that you understand, shows that you've been listening and taking in the information, um, and also gives them a chance to correct if it's just like, well, that's not exactly what happened. Um, it makes sure that you really understand what was going on in the situation. And then finally, distraction, and more specifically, avoiding distraction. So one of the easiest ways to think about this is in terms of the place that you're in. So if somebody comes to talk to you and you're in a loud, loud space, or you're trying to take a phone call and listen to someone, and you're in the middle of like all sorts of volume, it's going to be really difficult to hear what's going on. And that's probably the easiest distraction that we think of. But then there's also the distraction of that idea of, you know, having your cell phone 
I'm just checking my email really quick while we're having this conversation. It's not a problem until you realize that you've been reading that email for like 20 seconds while someone's talking and then you have no clue what they've been saying. And then they ask you a question. Oh no, like this is the worst thing ever. I am not ready to respond. I did not hear what they were saying. I have now been caught in not listening at all. So making sure that you have your phone put away, anything that's gonna distract you from the conversation put away. But then the other piece too is knowing your capacity for listening as a distraction. So if you are working on something, and it has to be done in the next hour. And someone is coming to you with, hey, I just had the worst thing happen to me and I need to talk to someone. There is no problem saying, hey, I am working on this project and I have to get it done in the next hour, but is there any way that you can call me back or is there any way that we can talk in about an hour when I'm done with this? I really wanna hear what you have to say. And I know that that is always a hard thing to do, particularly when someone's like, I really need to share this right now but it's also a much better situation than you half listening because you're focused on the project that you have to do and realizing that you haven't really been paying attention because you were too stressed out about the fact that you're losing time working on your project. So just being open and upfront about your limits and your capacity um, to listen so that other people know where you are and what they can expect from you. So, We've looked at EPMD, we've looked at how to be an active listener, but that's really for when you are having a conversation with someone who you are invested in and you really wanna understand what they're saying and they are really invested in trying to communicate what they're saying, but it's not always like that. You know, we have strong emotions that come into play sometimes. Um, there are times that we need to communicate with people that we don't get along with, um, or like we've had a really stressful day and we are exhausted, and then somebody comes to tell us something, or someone comes to give us feedback, um, and you are just too exhausted to be able to process it effectively. Or if you have to give a teammate or a coworker some constructive feedback, that's never an easy situation to be in. So what do we do to be able to navigate those situations more effectively? So we always like to use this model called breaking the defensive chain. And this is a really good way to think about when we're having those difficult conversations, when emotions are involved, or when you're giving um, difficult feedback to someone, some ways that we can go about doing that a little bit more effectively. And all of these, these four tools are important whether you're giving, receive, giving that feedback or receiving the feedback, whether you're talking or whether you're listening, um, equally important. So step one, um, if you are giving or receiving difficult feedback is always inquiring or at least thinking about the inquiry. So if you're receiving that feedback, ask those follow-up questions. You wanna make sure that you understand what the person is, is telling you. You wanna make sure that you're able to put it into practice. And the only way that you can do that is by really understanding what it is that they have to say. So step one is ask questions and not defensive questions, but instead questions that really try and get at what the other person is saying. So can you give me some examples of a time that I've done that? or um, can you give me some feedback on ways that I might be able to put that into practice? Do you have any ideas on how I might be able to, to do that in a better way? And asking those follow-up questions shows that you're invested, that you are interested in what the other person has told you and you wanna fix it. You wanna try and take those steps. So inquiry is great in that point. On the other side, if you're the one giving the feedback, you wanna proactively think about what are the questions that that person might ask? So come in ready to give examples, come in ready to talk about um, ways that they can proactively fix it moving forward. And you wanna make sure that you're thinking about those things before you enter in the conversation so that you're ready um, to really explore it with the other person, which once again shows that it's not just, I'm telling you a thing that I don't like, but it's I'm invested in helping you to improve. I'm invested in making this better because I've taken time to think through the things that can be done to make this more effective moving forward. Step two for breaking the defensive chain is determining why you feel how you feel. And with this one in particular, um, there are a lot of situations in life where it can leave long lasting impacts. So I don't know if any of you are like from a family of five or more kids where you had a lot of siblings and you were always fighting for your parents' attention. And so it was always just this like struggle to get your parents to listen to you. And so all of a sudden you're in a work meeting and right after the meeting, someone comes up to you and says, hey, I just wanted to let you know, like, I feel like you talk too much. 
and you don't really give other people the opportunity to, to speak. So for most people, they'll hear that and they'll be like, oh, okay, cool, I will try and work on that. But for somebody who has spent their whole life having to fight to be heard, hearing that may make this irrational response of like, why are you telling, like, I have to fight to be heard and you're telling me that like, now it's too much. I don't even know where to go from there. So if you realize that that's where you're coming from of like, hey, I'm responding really strangely because I have this background, I have this experience, sharing that with the other person and saying, yeah, I know, I, for me, that's something that I've kind of dealt with my whole life of, you know, trying to, trying to be heard by my parents, trying to be heard by my family. Um, and so it's definitely something that I'm trying to work on. It first of all, lets them know that you've heard what they've said um, and that you're invested in trying to fix it. But it also lets them know that like there's some struggles there. There are some things that you're having to work with. And so it'll probably encourage them to be a little patient, be a little more patient with you as you're going through the process of fixing those things. The third piece for breaking the defensive chain is depersonalizing the situation. So as much as you can, really focusing on the action rather than on the person. It's not the person who's, who's wrong or who's making things difficult. It's the actions that they're doing. So like we said, you know, if, if somebody is uh, approached as you talk too much, instead of the you talk too much, can it be a conversation of, hey, I wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to speak during the meeting. So would it be possible um, to step back a little bit and let other people talk a little bit more? So approaching it from the context of, here's what I'm trying to achieve, or here's the goal that I'm trying to achieve. And here's a behavior that you can do that will help to achieve that goal. Rather than saying you're doing something wrong, instead focusing on you know, what is the positive aspect and what is the action that is required or needed from the other person. And then for calming communication tools, I always like to describe this one as Texas barbecue. So for Texas barbecue, you always want it low and slow. And that is the same way that you should approach kind of defensive conversations or conversations where you're giving um, hard to hear feedback. So keep it low, which means don't escalate, don't get louder um, as the other person is, is processing the information. Even if they're getting louder, you wanna make sure that you're keeping your voice calm um, and, and low, but also slow. So don't speed up because speed up also gives the impression um, that you are getting upset or um, that, that conflict is rising. So low, slow, and then also, I can't uh, overstate the importance of pauses. Give the other person time to process the information that you're giving them. Make sure that you're taking a step back and allowing them to go through those steps of inquiring. Because if you just, if you kind of harp on the idea of, hey, you've been doing this, and this is why I really don't like that you've been doing this, and this is the way that it impacts other people when you do this. And if you could stop doing it, it would really make it better. By the time you get to the end of that kind of litany of complaints, the other person is usually feeling totally demoralized and like, I don't know how to move forward. So make sure that you stop, just say, hey, here's the thing that I've noticed. Here's a way that you can make it better. Pause, let them think about it, let them process, let them ask questions. And that'll really help to prevent that kind of escalation, both in terms of tone um, and in terms of severity. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're going low, you're going slow, and you're adding those pauses in to allow the other person time to process the information. So we've been through a lot. I wanna stop there and see if y'all have any questions, anything that I can help with. Definitely. Um, and particularly if you're in a, a situation where um, it's a little bit easier if you can be in a one-on-one -on -one situation, but those are much, much harder to come by in virtual times. So asking the other person if it's okay, like, hey, I have some things um, that I'd like to recommend. Is it okay if we talk about those? Um, it's definitely there, people can tend to be more receptive if you're asking ahead of time, rather than just kind of bombarding them with unexpected feedback. Absolutely. Any other thoughts or questions? <laughs> I like, it's, it's one thing that, that for me was always easy to remember too, is when I think about it that way, I was like, low and slow, got it. So the last piece that I want to talk about is specific to kind of where we are now and thinking about how we communicate um, in times of social distancing. So what are some of the things that, that you've seen in terms of kind of the past year 
and the ways that communication has changed are the things that you've noticed since we've been kind of going a little bit more digital or a lot more digital. <laughs> Definitely more sensitivity. Um, I think in a lot of ways, we weren't asking those questions before of, you know, how are you doing? Um, and it was just kind of expected that it would be a perfunctory, like, I'm doing fine. How about you? Um, that was the expectation. And I think now, at least in some places, we're starting to have those conversations a little bit better about really being open and honest about the things that we're struggling with as a, as a team. Absolutely. Um, more gestures um, and trying to bring your gestures up so that people can see them. I've definitely noticed doing that of like bringing my arms way higher than I normally would uh, when I'm trying to explain something. Length of conversations is shortened, definitely. So individual conversations, it is hard. It is hard to really check in one-on-one -on -one because the second that meeting is ending, usually everybody has another meeting to get. To. Um, and so there's really not that time to check in a lot of times. Um, in a one-on-one -on -one way. So those individual conversations have become so short and it's just like trying to share everything that you need to share in two to three minutes. Being able to see your own facial expressions is an odd nuance that like you can actually <laughs> see your own things that you're doing during a chat now on Zoom. Definitely. And I know for, for introverts in particular, that's one of those things that it's not about being on screen and seeing other people. It's that if I see my screen up there, I am focused on how I'm looking and making sure that my face is doing the right things at all times. And so for introverts in particular, that struggle of, I need to make sure that I'm doing the right thing and responding to the right social keys or else this is all gonna fall apart. Oh, that awful moment when you see yourself on someone else's screen when screen share, that is a rough one. I think I missed one. And yeah, I know um, in terms of as we've gotten further and further on, there was a point right around November where before November, everyone kept their video on. And it was just kind of like that was you knew that the majority of people at least would have a video on. And right around November, at least for me, it just hit where like no one kept their video on anymore. And everyone was just like, this is too much. Like I can't consistently engage in that way. It takes so much more energy to have my video on and know that I'm doing those things. And so it's hard um, when people don't necessarily want to do the video chatting or don't want to engage in that way. And it's like, yeah, I'll totally have a phone call, um, but I don't want to show my face. I don't want to, I don't want to do those things. And absolutely, that, that barrier between home and the classroom um, or home and work is gone. Um, and trying to figure out how to make that balance. I have not figured that out yet. Um, I'm definitely still in the like 60 hour work week phase um, at least. And so it's that challenge of like, when do you disconnect? When do you stop? And it's, it's not always an easy thing to do. So thinking about how we, oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I definitely feel that. Because that's the other piece too, is it's just like before we were able to go to work and focus on work. And now it's, you know, we have kids who are there at the same time and we're not only doing our work, but we're also, you know, raising children. We're also all those things around the house that when we went to work before we could forget about, about like, yeah, I need to take the trash out. Yeah, I need to do all those things just to keep the house running. All of a sudden that's in front of your face all day. So not only are you stressed out about all the things that you have to do for work, but it's also stressed out about all the things that you have to do at home that are now right in front of you in the same way. So absolutely. And I think that that's important. So we're still writing the norms of online meetings. We're still setting those expectations. And I think uh, last night we had uh, a program called Leadership, which is all about leadership development. And we were talking about some of the ways in which the past year has really changed our perspective and our perception of the changes that we can make and what we are able to do as a society and things that just a year ago it's like well that's just the reality like you can't change that that is something that is immutable it's something that is always going to be 
And in a lot of ways, so many of those things from one year ago now are up in the air. And it's, you know, we can change that. We can change the way our society functions at a fundamental level. And in some ways, it's not just that we can, but it's also we're going to have to. When, when we rewrite, when we look at coming back, when we look at being together in public spaces again, really, for the first time, we're going to have to rethink some of those things that were just commonplace before. And while that's a challenge and it's a struggle, it also gives us an amazing opportunity to really think about what are the things that we were doing that don't work anymore? Our society has changed. Our society has, has grown um, and evolved. And in a lot of ways, we were just doing a lot of things because that's what we had always done. So in particular, as we think about communication and our communication styles, really being open and honest as we start those processes of trying to come back together more often. Um, really thinking about what is it that is expected of me in terms of communication and making sure to set those expectations clearly with supervisors, with coworkers, um, and making those breaks in ways that I know before for a lot of people in student affairs, it was always a, you don't give out your cell phone to students. That's just not a thing that you do. And at least for me in this past year, if I had not given out my cell phone to students, I would not have been able to do my job. Like that was just a piece that for me, I knew that I had to change. But also in that change, that changed the way that students interacted with me. And so they would text me at you know, 10, 11 p.m. and be like, hey, I have this question. Can you answer it really quickly? So then it becomes setting those boundaries of, you have my text, you have my phone number, but I also, I won't be responding to texts after 10 p.m. or um, even after business hours, setting those expectations of, you have that and I will get it and I will respond to it as soon as I get in the next morning. And then it's totally fine to set those boundaries. But you have to be clear about what those boundaries are so that other people know what to expect from you. And really that gets to the, the whole crux of this workshop, which is really communications is about expectations. It's about what the expectations of other people are for us. Um, and it's about the expectations that we set for ourselves. So when we communicate, we're communicating for a purpose. We're communicating for a reason. And our goal is to achieve that purpose. So we always have to look at our communication as a means to an end, as we are trying to, um, we were trying to accomplish a goal. Whereas a lot of times I think, we've in the past really thought of it more as the end itself of if I present it well, it doesn't matter um, what happens after that. It's just, I have the responsibility on my end of controlling those means. But there is an important part of really thinking through what you're trying to accomplish and did, did what you, um, did the, the ways that you implemented that communication style, did they work effectively for you? Taking some time to reflect on it and think about what could I have done better? So I know we're getting close to time and I wanna make sure that we have some time to wrap up and have questions at the end. So is there anything based on what we've talked about so far um, that you'd like to know a little bit more about? And please, I, if you're typing, oops, sorry, go ahead. I have a question if, if nobody is gonna go uh, first. I, I like the idea of when you were saying that some people like to communicate in say two sentences, or some people prefer to communicate with six or seven sentences. Do you always have to match the other or can you keep your communication style? And I say that because sometimes I think short sentences are a little robotic and you don't understand the person's thought process. And with being working at home, I like more information to try and understand who my coworkers are. So how do you how do you keep your communication style but not irritate the other like a short sentence person? Definitely. So I think the key there is it is a, an issue of balance of that doesn't necessarily mean that you go from a six sentence person to a two sentence person, but maybe finding that like four sentence mid 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 range spot. <laughs> okay. Um, because I, th I think one of the things that does happen is for people who are used to two sentences and they see the six sentences, as a result of there being six sentences, they think, oh, this person has something that they're trying to hide or this person has something that they are feeling, um, feeling discomfort about or something that, that I should be reading a little bit more into. 
And so the longer emails actually prompt them to then start reading into it more, uh, as opposed to um, for somebody who expects the six sentences, if they get an email with two sentences, they are going crazy because it's just like, I have no idea if this is sincere. I have no idea if this person is expecting something totally different. Um, and so I think it's that idea of finding the mid spot and something that develops over time of having that experience working with someone and knowing kind of what they expect and adjusting based on the responses that you're getting. So if somebody is clearly like coming back and saying, hey, I don't know if this is what you wanted, but here's something and you feel like you've been really clear in your emails, okay, maybe I need to either kind of give a little bit more direction or I need to cut back and just kind of let them go if that's something that you're comfortable with. So yeah, a, com great question. a common theme in my family was always when somebody shared information that if you had a connection to that, that you would share it. But mm -hmm. I've learned recently that potentially that that is sort of taking away from the story or the experience that someone else is telling you. I'm just curious on the interpersonal communication aspect of that. Definitely. And I think that honestly kind of goes along in the same way of um, when we talk about active listening, one of the things that comes up a lot of times is uh, the person listens and does not try to give feedback or advice. And that's something that a lot of people are looking for. But there are some people that are looking for that. Like, if I come to you with a problem, it's because I want you to help me solve it. And so it's learning a little bit more about, uh, about the other people. And like with family, you usually have a pretty good sense of, are they people who want you to help solve the problem and work through it with them? Are they somebody who just like, I had this experience and I just want to vent right now. I don't need feedback. I don't need responses. I just want to get this off my chest. Um, and it's something that once again, takes time to develop that relationship to know what they're looking for. But usually um, you'll get a pretty good sense of if you're giving feedback and they look like they've disconnected, chances are they just wanted to vent. And on the other side, like if they're giving something they're looking for something more, they'll usually ask some probing questions if they're not getting what they need. And so that'll give you a little bit of idea of, okay, you're looking for advice. You want me to help you. You want me to talk through this with you. So just focusing on the responses of the other person. Are they looking for more or do they look like they're disconnecting because you're giving too much? Thank you. I feel like something that comes to mind when we need to write emails to colleagues or, or to your, you know, your bosses or anything, if, if you need something, I, I think it's easier to think about it uh, in terms of a SMART goal. You know, what is a SMART goal? It's specific, measurable, you know, you break down the acronym and if you need something, you put those specific items in there, you know, the expectation is there, the clarity is there. So at that point, if there's a communication breakdown, I mean, I would hope that it would be at least easy to spot where and why it happened. Definitely. And thank you for that perfect lead in. If you're interested in learning more about SMART goals, our team management workshop covers all about SMART goals. So please come and join us for that one as well. And it is, it's not just something for, um, SMART goals aren't just something for like long-term goals. It can be in an email of, is this email specific? Is it relevant? Is it timely? Um, do I make it clear when I need the answer by or if I need the answer? And those are definitely big pieces. Awesome. Well, I know we're right up against time and I wanna make sure y'all get to, you probably have one o'clock meetings that y'all need to get to. So I do wanna make sure that you're able to do that. But importantly, somebody so, just asked about your, certific your certification program and where do you find your other ones? Okay. So all of our workshops, um, we're adding them right now for the April sessions. And so all the April sessions will be up on Rowdy Link um, by tomorrow. So we do have every, let me type it in, every Monday at noon and every Tuesday at three, or sorry, I don't know why I said three, every Tuesday at six, and um, we have workshops. So we tried to make one during the day and then one after work hours so that hopefully you can make it to it. And the way that we schedule them is, like I said, it's 10 workshops but we alternate um, every month. So the sessions that were on Mondays one month will be on Tuesdays the next month. So you can, if you are able to do Mondays and Tuesdays, you can do the whole program within a month. If you're able to do just Monday or Tuesday, you can do the whole program within two months. So we try to make it as kind of easy and user-friendly as possible. 
Absolutely. Criticism is so hard to take, but when it feels like an attack, it's, uh, it's a lot more difficult to try and process effectively. So depersonalizing it really goes a long way. So thank you all so much. And then there is a, um, as part of the event when you signed in, and there is kind of a post event uh, process. So if you'll go ahead and when you have those responses, um, if you'll send them, uh, Tracy, do you want them direct to you? Um, are you talking about the badging type of homework? Yes, the badging homework. Sorry. So what I can do is in case people don't know that you can get a badge from this session, I'll send out a link. I've got everybody's registration information. So I can send the link for the badge. And then that information on how to get the badge is in that link. But then the homework will be sent to you because I'm guessing, uh, yeah, the homework will be sent to you. Perfect. I couldn't remember which one it goes to. So yep. we'll get it sent to me. But this, yes, this would be your first one. Um, and then just really quickly. Um, so in Rowdy Link, once you log in, if you click on the circle on the top right, it'll either have your first initial in it or it'll have a picture of you if you put one in. And if you click on that and just go to pads, it'll show you all the workshops that you've already done as well as all the action steps that there are to do. So if you have any questions about what workshops are out there and what you need to do to complete the program, this will be kind of an up-to-date. It'll show you what you've done already and what you need to do. And so I'm just gonna put a link in the chat real quick. And if you will click on that link, That'll get you counted um, within Rowdy Link for attendance for today's workshop.